everything follows a life cycle. Plants, animals, humans. So why not the stars? Hi, my name is Marta, I'm Italian and I'm going to talk about the life cycle of stars. The life cycle of a star is made up of four phases. The formation, main sequence, post-main sequence and the final phase of the evolution. The first phase, the formation, is essentially the birth of the star. The stars are born from nebulae, which are clouds composed of gas and dust. They are in the interstellar medium and consist mostly of hydrogen, helium and traces of fever elements. They are high density regions, about 10,000 particles instead of zero. Their temperature rises from 10 Kelvin, that is the space temperature, to about 1000 Kelvin. They are distributed along the spiral arms of our galaxy, which is where star formation takes place. Generally speaking, stars are formed after the gravitational collapse of this nebula. The nebula divides itself into many dense cores. Each of these cores will later form a star. The dense cores collapse and the hot and compressed gas at the center of it turns into a protostar. The matter gets more and more opaque and holds radiation more, with a resulting rise in temperature. Only when temperatures reach 10 million Kelvin, reaction became effective and prevents a gravitational collapse. The protostar therefore became a star, so this is the birth of a star. The second phase is called main sequence. Here stars spend about 90% of their existence in a stable state, during which they fuse the hydrogen of their core into helium at high temperature and pressure. The main sequence is described in a very important diagram called H&R diagram. But I think this diagram can be better explained by its creators, Angel Rathbrook and Henry Norris Russell. We meet again at last, Angel. I can't understand why they keep on calling you to talk about my diagram. I introduce myself. My name is Erin Norris Russell, famous American astronomer. In 1930, I published my diagram, known as Russell Diagram, exactly. My name is Angela Rathbrun, Danish, the true inventor of this diagram, which I published in 1908, before Russell. Now I will tell you that he made this all without knowing about my previous work, but after more than 100 years, I still find it hard to believe it. Let's forget it, Angela. The truth is that we must bring the diagram on our own, and for this reason it is called H&R diagram. It connects two fundamental properties of stars, the intrinsic luminosity on the vertical axis, which is about 4.5 for the Sun, and the surface temperatures revealed by the color of the star on the horizontal axis. While developing the diagram, I realized that most stars are in the same areas, since the areas where they are not present are those where there are the necessary conditions for their existence. Imagine the starry sky you see at night. Stars seem to be present everywhere, right? Actually, if you connect them in this diagram, you will find out that they occupy only some areas of the universe. Therefore, try to look at the sky with different eyes tonight. We really need a catchphrase, Russell. Well done. I think this is the first time you have paid me a compliment in a hundred years. Don't wait for other ones in the next hundred. So, most of the stars are a in the diagram are on a diagonal, going from the upper left to the lower right. This diagonal is called the main sequence. The bigger the mass of the star, the higher the temperature of the core. So, the reactions of fusion will take place more rapidly, making the star brighter and hotter. Therefore, we can see that the brightest, biggest and hottest stars are at the top left, and those less luminous are at the bottom right. You have surely noticed that this main sequence is determined the primary by the mass. As Martha said before, stars keep an internal balance that holds them in the same position in the diagram for most of their lives. In the diagram, you can see that beside the main sequence, there are other regions populated by stars. At the top right, there is the group of giants and supergiants. They are brighter and to the main sequence, but have the same temperatures and color. Why are they brighter? Because they have huge dimensions, and later you will find out where they derive from. You like to create suspense, don't you? Anyway, the other group is at the bottom left. These stars have the same temperatures and color as the stars in the main sequence, but they are less bright. As they are less bright, they are also smaller in size, and they are called white dwarfs. I'd say we have finished as soon. Hopefully we have been clear, or better still, bright. Those two are really strange. Let's resume. We were dealing with the second phase, that is the principal phase. 
After this one, the next phases will be shorter than the previous ones. The third phase is called post-main sequence. In this phase, the star follows different ways according to the mass of the celestial object. Stars with masses lower than 0.4 solar masses are called red dwarfs. They make up at least 67.5% of all the stars in the Milky Way. Once a good part of the hydrogen in their core is fusing to helium, these stars become possible blue dwarfs. The luminosity of stars increases as they get old, and brighter star needs to radiate its energy more rapidly and strongly in, it, in order to keep its balance. However, it is so that the red dwarfs, instead of expanding into giants, increase the speed of nuclear reactions, with the consequent increase of their surface temperatures, and a color that tends to blue. The blue dwarfs would later evolve into white dwarfs, as soon as they have completely run out of their hydrogen. All of this, however, is just a theory, because their star remains stable for a very long period in the principal sequence, a period which is by far longer than the present age of the universe. Therefore, it is believed that star of this kind has not formed yet. On the contrary, stars with masses between 0.4 and 10 solar masses will go through a phase characterized by high stability at the end of the main sequence. The core undergoes several gravitational collapses and increases its temperatures, while the outer layers, reacting to the energy surplus they receive from the core, expand and cool. Consequently, they get their color tending more and more to red. After that, the star turns into a cold but bright red giant, with an inner core of helium and a shell where the hydrogen fusion continues. The phase is much shorter than the main sequence, for example, the Sun will remain in the main sequence 10 billion years. Since five of them have elapsed so far, there are still many more left. In the phase of Red Giant, it will remain about 1-2 million years. Once the process of hydrogen fusion into helium is over, stars with masses over 10 solar masses start the conversion of helium into carbon. Big stars expand and reach the phase of Red Supergiants, and proceed then with the synthesis of other even elements. The core looks layered, such a structure is compared to the concentric layers of an onion. In each shell, the fusion of different elements occurs. The closer one gets to the core, the higher temperatures and the pressure. We have now come to the final part, called the final phase of the evolution. Like in the previous one, also this phase varies according to the mass of the celestial object. Stars with a smaller masses form white dwarfs, which are stars with a size similar to that of the Earth, but with much higher density and temperatures. Temperatures decrease according to the thermal exchange with the surrounding space, until the object reaches the final phase of a black dwarf. However, this is just a theoretical model, because up to now no black dwarfs have been observed yet. For this reason, astronomers believe that the time needed to a black dwarf to cool completely is by far longer than the present age of the universe. Stars with masses up to 8 solar masses during the phase of red giant expel their external layers, which are ionized by the ultraviolet radiation present in the core. The resulting shell looks like a bubble-shaped nebula, which gradually gets far and leaves a white dwarf in the middle. Planetary nebulae have a small size and short life of some dozens of thousands of years. Stars with masses over 8 solar masses, which are in the phase of red giants, continue nuclear fusion until the core reaches the mass beyond the limit. Then a collapse occurs, which brings about the explosion into a supernova. Afterwards, a pulsar is generated, which is a particularly dense object made up of neutrons. If the initial mass is very big, the gravitational collapse doesn't stop, and a black hole is created. This is the end of the life of a star. When we look at the sky, they seem to be unchangeable, while actually they transform themselves and follow a life cycle. We could therefore think them alive and smiling at us. <laughs>